Hello? Hello? Are you here? Indeed you are, and we're very happy that you are. It's the Paul Leslie Hour, and today, part two of Clay Eel's interview with the legendary Jimmy Buffett. We were saddened, of course, by the loss of this great musical artist who passed away at only 76 years of age, but left behind an incredible catalog of recordings. If you haven't heard part one of the Jimmy Buffett interview with Clay Eels, make sure to find it on this channel. Subscribe to Paul Leslie's YouTube channel so you don't miss a thing. Clay and Paul will talk for just a couple of minutes, and then we'll roll into the second part of this never-before-heard interview with Jimmy Buffett. Clay Eels did this interview by phone in October of 2000 for his landmark book, Steve Goodman Facing the Music. So, part two, let's listen together. So, Clay, the second part of your interview with Jimmy Buffett seems to focus on the songs. And a lot of the songs that Jimmy Buffett recorded, these are some of my favorites. Jimmy Buffett both co-wrote songs with Steve Goodman, but he also covered a couple like Banana Republics and California Promises. Of those songs, as a man writing a book about Steve Goodman, which you did, which song were you the most curious about? Well, of all of their co-writes, uh, many of them held a lot of interest for me, and, and so did the Goodman songs that you mentioned that Buffett covered. But probably the one that I was intrigued about most was their co-write about the TV game show Let's Make a Deal, and that song was called Door Number Three. It's quite a funny song. It's a great satire, and the reason I was intrigued was because if you listen to each of their versions, Goodman's version and Buffett's version had different lyrics at the end. I mean, Goodman's uh, version, he, he does a brilliant, just a straight steal of lyrics from Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone, which is incredibly clever if you think about it, because because the lyrics fit the song so well, and including the classic line, you know, do you want to make a deal? <laughs> but <laughs> but Buffett went a different way altogether at the end of the song. He he decided to be more caustic and to call the game show host Monty Hall. Remember him? Right. He, he called Monty Hall a son of a bitch. And I was able to ask Jimmy about that in the interview, and he gave quite a nice answer. So that's where that was one where, you know, if you're prepared with with knowing your material, you can kind of get down to some nice nitty gritty. For so many of the listeners of this show, the songs are important in everything from the lyrics to the co-writers. So I think it's time. Let's begin the second part of Clay Eel's interview with Jimmy Buffett. This took place in October of 2000, being brought out for the first time now. Let's go into the songs. You talked about songwriting. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, in general, you had a pattern of how you wrote together. When I talked to Michael Smith, he he said that uh, Stevie would call him up and say, I'm coming through town for a few weeks. Let's write a song. When I get there, you tell me what it's going to be about. And uh, so Michael would do that, and then instantly Stevie would come up with the first line. And that uh, you know, that was their M.O. sort of. Yeah. Did you guys have an M.O.? You know, did you say, we're going to sit really. down? Not really. I write? think it was kind of that way that, you know, it, it, it all depended on if somebody was working on a project. I, you know, Banana Republic, which I recorded, I just loved that song. I think, you know, I yeah. might have been the inspiration for that because I was the one that always got him to get I think I, I was the one that sent him off a trip. I can't remember. Down to St. Croix. Yeah, he went to St. Croix and wrote that song there because I was, you know, down in the Caribbean at that time. And when I heard it, I just loved it. It was sounded like a song, you know, that I should have written. And, uh, well, I bet you get people asking you all the time if you, if you wrote it or they yeah, can it. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, it started. I mean, I always loved his sense of humor in his songs, which, which I did. And we all wrote for each other. But then 
I think door number three, we were just kind of, I was playing around with it and we were there and I was staying there and we just kind of went in one day and said, you know, let's, that, that's kind of the way it just happened. It was very This was at his spontaneous. house. This was at his house? Yeah. Um, one interview, he says that you guys were sitting around about 1130 in the morning watching TV and drinking a pitcher of pina coladas. Probably. And he says, we tried for 20 minutes and then I finally said, I, I don't know what Jay's got on the table. And then he says, the song wrote itself. That's it probably was that, you know, I remember sitting around and then, you know, um, it was just, that's the kind of way we did it. And we would kind of, at that time, you know, we were traveling, I was kind of out of Nashville at that time and he was in and out of Nashville. And so if he would show up, I mean, he'd do anything. It just was a matter, it was a pleasure being around him as a friend and as an inspiration. And it, it really didn't matter whether, you know, he came and he played guitar on quite a few things later on. That's right. And uh, in the early days, we wrote more together because we were we were not as busy. There was time to hang out. Then as things got busier, yeah, he'd always poke in a song, you know, California Promises. Right. He'd, he'd always slip one in on me there. You know, he was a crafty <laughs> little businessman as well. <laughs> and but when it, it never seemed to fail that when album time would come around, you know, Goodman would pop in and go, oh, well, I got this little song here, you know, and I'd be like in the studio and I'd have to go, okay, we'll cut this thing. That's what ca- California Promises. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, for for door number three, Steve said that uh, it was your idea that you'd always wanted to write a song about. Let's make a deal. Yeah, I, I watched that show. I was kind of in love with Carol Merrill, <laughs> and uh, and I and the absurdity of the whole thing. You know? Sure, sure. Um, but but you have a. I mean, you you both have the same song except for the last verse. He does that Dylan lyric. And then you've got the one, you know, son of a bitch, yeah. you know, and yours is a little more caustic at the end. It's, it's more of a, you know, blatant, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it really goes after Bonnie again. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think I'd ever choke Bonnie, you know, it just was, you know, it's, just, it's a song, you know, it's, uh, there's right. some days you just wanted to, you know, like any, you know, there are days you want to turn the television off. It's kind of was a reference to that, you know, so. Sure. I don't know. Is there any, uh, I mean, is there any reason that, that Steve didn't want to use that verse and you did? And, yeah, I don't know. And you didn't want to use the Dylan verse and you did? I mean, no, I, I, I don't. There's cleverness you know. both of them. It's a, yeah. It's an interesting kind of little detail about why they're <laughs> different. Um, when, when you had just written this, uh, Goodman was on, uh, it's like three in the morning on her Philadelphia radio show with Gene Shea and he performed that. And this was before he got on the album. And then he says, um, Jimmy and I have got another one we're working on called I'll Bet Mel Blank's Got Money in the Bank. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Um, that was my idea because I was a Looney Tune fan. And you know what? I, uh, I'd never finished writing it. Uh-huh. But uh, <laughs> I can do the lyrics right now, you know. Oh, tell me. No. I see, it started, I bet Mel Blank's got money in the bank with all the voices he could do. Foghorn, Daffy Duck, Porky Pig, just to mention a few. If you're lying in bed, sick, sick in the head, here's what you, don't worry, something. I bet Mel Blank's got money in the bank. Maybe he'll give something to you. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. That's the. Uh, Did Steve work on that with you? Was he a part writer of it? Or? I don't think so. I can't remember. I mean, it was just that, that's as far as that song ever got. It sure sounds like a, a Goodman and You type song. You know, but he had that kind of a sense of humor, you know, that kind of, to, you know, I'm working on new stuff today. I've got one called uh, What If the Hokey Pokey Is All It Really Is About. <laughs> you know, I mean, so it's still, I don't know if that's the ghost of Steve Goodman or not. <laughs> that's something that, that he told you about? No, oh, you're working. Oh, I'm see. working on that right now. You, all, you, okay. You, they're always in the in the blender kind of. Yeah. Um, next year, woman going crazy on Caroline Street. That that's in Key West. Did right. Steve spend time with you there, or how did that song come about? What's his contribution to it? Um, uh, I think I had started it again. There were lots of times, you know, I would just be. I, you know, I'd, I'd look at if I had enough songs to go into the studio and if I didn't and if I was working on something, you know, I knew by that time we could collaborate on things and it was a good chemistry. Yeah. And, uh, which you got to understand doesn't happen often. I was not a big collaborator in those days. Mm-hmm. And still am not. Mm-hmm. Um, 
uh, but it worked very well. So, you know, I think Caroline Street was almost nearly written, and he was either down there, and I can't even remember what was going on. I know about the Caroline Street story and where I got the ideas from, but yeah. as far as cutting it, I'm not sure. Uh, I think that I just sent that to him, or we talked about it, and, uh, and he came up with some ideas. That's kind of the way it works. It came originally from you, and he helped you out, kind of? Okay. Um, and then, uh, but I'm jumping five years later to Where's the Party? Um, that was him. That was him. He started that, then I kind of finished up on that. It seems like one of these uh, coming out of your early persona things. It's like, uh, you know, being tired of the party. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, I, you know. I, I for one, never dissect things. I mean, if it's uh, if yeah. it's got a good lyric and if it, you know, the song was haunting. I mean, Banana Republic spoke to me. California Promises spoke to me. Sure, Where's the Party spoke to me, and I never, I never go deeper than that. I mean, uh, that's you know. Well, there's one that's on the same album that's a little more literal, and that's a, it's Midnight and I'm Not Famous Yet. Yeah, and the, and that's a co-writing credit. Where, where did that one come from? It's a, uh, that is after, after a wild weekend in Lake Tahoe. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, all of that technical stuff, 32 hop and $10 yo. And, well, I was a crap player. Yeah? Yeah. How was Steve as a crap player? I don't know. Or did he... I, I kind of started that. That was another one that he finished up, you know. It seems like there's a lot of I mean, there's a lot of really funny rhyming in that. Not funny bad, but funny, funny. You know, I mean, Reno. Well, Kino, you try to get a couple of them, yeah. Kino yeah. and Reno, I think that was his. Yeah. Lester Polyester. And, I mean, he he had a way with rhyming. You do, too. I mean, it's like you guys were made for each other to do that kind of stuff. Well, that's the thing I was saying. We could bounce off of each other, you know, like that. Yeah. The last one that is a co-writing credit is, is Frank and Lola. Yeah. And, uh, and it, it says that you wrote it in 1982, which is two years before the Goodman died, but, yeah. but it didn't come out until the year afterward on uh-huh. the, the mango album. Huh? Um, any thoughts about how that came about and how the two of you worked on that? I mean, um, you know, I started Frank and Lola. That's as close as I could get at those days to a relationship song. It was kind of, you know, <laughs> uh-huh. I think if you all, even in all the all the trials and tribulations we have to go through, I think the other thing that I got to be was the way, I mean, even through his leukemia was the fact that this amazing sense of humor that he had about dying. Mm-hmm. He had an amazing spirit in that respect, you know, and to his last day. Uh, and when he had it, he called that thing, he had a turkey, a turkey base. Mm-hmm. He would go in and get these horrible things in New York. And he had this thing in his head that was shooting stuff in there. Mm-hmm. And I know when he was not feeling good and when he wasn't, but his amazing sense of humor and right to the very end was kind of what, you know, uh, and, and, uh, you know, we'd always talked about writing some other things, but I knew that he was getting very sick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, you know, to keep Frank and Lola, you know, even in, in something that's a bad relationship, we could not look at it without having our sense of humor. Sure. Even in the tragedy of his early death, mm-hmm. it's in humor, uh, really, with an inspiration to him and me, and I, I think everybody else, that's mm-hmm. the way he approached it. Um, so you, you each brought a sense of humor to the song, but you also brought a... a lyrical craft, too. I mean, you talked a lot about songwriting being a craft. Oh, I think so, too. And I think that's the other thing, like I said, back to the early days, that, you know, it's like having a mold. If we go back into baseball terms, you know, it's kind of have like a utility infielder. You know, as a performer, Mm -hmm. uh, you can have people that can sing or that can play or can write. But when you can do all of them, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a very good singer and I'm not a very good guitar player but I can crack and craft the show and I can craft the song so you play to your strongest suit but you're kind of like a utility player mm-hmm. and I think that's what appealed to us that there was a guy that could really move an audience on the stage and also could really craft the song mm-hmm. so you know those are what I consider after all these years my two strongest uh, traits you know in, in mm-hmm. terms of being a performer I'm certainly not a gifted guitar player or some dazzling singer or somebody that 
uh, wiggling around on the stage. <laughs> I know my, uh, I play to my strong. I think you learn that as the experience goes on. But in the beginning, you know, that's why I don't think I've really changed much in 30 years. And I think that mm-hmm. that's what, you know, Goodman was kind of a, not only an inspiration, but a partner in that because we kind of, it, it's kind of like being on uh, it, knowing, you know, performing his magic. You know, you can't explain how to do that. People mm-hmm. try to figure it out. Well, good luck. <laughs> you know, it's something yeah. you're you're given as a gift, and uh, and it's it's great to, you know, I, I try to to take advantage of the fact that I've got this gift and have to use it to the best of my ability. And I think it, you can see somebody else that that does it as well as Steve did. You know, it's inspiring, and it always was then, and still is. Would you? Would you say he he had all strong suits? I mean, you know, he was a much better guitar player now. He was a good acoustic guitar player. Yeah, you know, he really was, and he had a you know. Uh, but you know, I'd still say his performing and his writing outweighs his his playing mm-hmm. and his singing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just you know, he was a good singer. I'm not a great singer, and he was a good guitar player, not a great guitar player. And, uh, mm-hmm. But he could really craft the song, mm-hmm. and he could really. Craft an audience. He he used to talk about the the sort of the third or the fourth dimension. You know, there's there's singing, uh, songwriting, there's uh, playing, but then it's but being the entertainer was what he was after. Yeah, I mean that's what it is. I mean I think being an entertainer is what he really was best at. I think you know being and that's what I I consider myself. I don't uh, I consider myself an entertainer. You know that covers the basics. Um. And, you know, other people look at me as a songwriter, or, you know, there's the humor songs, there's the sensitive songs, and so they, there's enough out there for everybody to make up which of me they want. Sure. But, you know, sure. I, I, when looking back at it, you know, I would say my craft is being an entertainer. I think that's a good Sure. Sure. Let me go back to a couple of songs that are that are similar of yours. I mean, uh, I'm wondering if he went to Paris, was influenced by Goodman's version of The Dutchman at all. I mean, there's something mm, I've never thought of it as that. It was actually it was it was more influenced by the guy Eddie Bauchowski who worked with right. the Quiet Night. Right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I love the Dutchman, but uh, I, you know, I didn't listen to it as a model for writing "He Went to Paris." You okay. know, I, that was really just Eddie Bauchowski and I. How about uh, Cheeseburger in Paradise and Chicken Cordon Blues? No, no, no. That was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's similar message there, but yeah. Um, I, there's a tape of Steve uh, doing death of an unpopular poet uh-huh. on the radio, and he's really very reverent. Uh, I mean, he he says, you know, if you really want to hear a good Jimmy Buffett song that doesn't get airplay, you got to hear this. Yeah. Why do you think that might have appealed to Steve that that song? That's- I don't know. You know, it's uh, it's one of my favorite songs, and it was one of those early songs. You know, sure. it's a cray. You know, if it's anything, it's a it's a well-written song, you know, and it was a song that came out of a passion of mine for Kenneth, passion for Kenneth Patchen, an old poet. That right. I kind of admire. And, uh, you know, it's like certain songs just, you know, even today, I mean, I'm putting a collection of songs together for my next album and there's a lot of outside material. You know, I, I don't look at it now like, Oh God, I got to go write another Jimmy Buffett song. I'm going to write what I feel is, mm-hmm acceptable and good for this but there's also you know quite a few outside pieces of material that since i haven't recorded in a while really speak to me and I, i'm gonna i'm gonna play them you know because i just think the song speaks to you sure and i you know i just think it's an honor that, that he you know when other people do your things it's like the time dylan did pirate you know? right i know but somebody had to tell me about that and i thought <laughs> wow you know i mean i think of all the bob dylan's I, uh, songs i've done i'd like to say about dylan not a lot of people out there say Bob Dylan did one of mine. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, uh, and it just must have, you know, people asking me, he just loved the song. You know, he still, yeah. when I saw Dylan later, he just loved that song. Well, so, you know, uh, there's enough of them out there of people that wrote that sure. I love, and I'm glad that, you know, I'm just happy to be included that, that his fellow artists, you know, it's a compliment to what you do. What he was saying about it, I think, in part explains it. He says that it's, it's, it's that it, there aren't references to Patchen in the song, um, so it's, it, it can be interpreted more broadly. So. Well, that's what I wanted to do. I mean, I try to still do that as a writer, even in fiction and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, I try to, uh, you know, 
you could paint pictures without, you know, putting a lot of details in there. Okay. That's, that's kind of what. Let me go to a couple of other Goodman songs you recorded. This Hotel Room. Yeah. Why did you like that? Well, because I'd lived in hotel room, and I thought he just nailed it. I just <laughs> thought it was just a wonderful piece of satire about living on the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I still do. It's a, it, uh, he also turns it into a love song at the end. <laughs> kind of a sneaky thing. Yeah. Um, we already talked about Banana Republic. So I'm, I'm wondering, you think you may have inspired it by, by telling him, you got to go down there, you got to go down there? I think so. I mean, you know, I was living that Caribbean life, and then he went to St. Croix. He went on a vacation, I think, and he wrote that song. He he says uh, this was originally just for the square group or fishermen down there. So that's what Jimmy Buffett called the runners. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of similar to your Tampico trauma that came out the same year. Yeah. Um, it's. Uh, what uh, if, I think it, I think Banana Republic's a better song. <laughs> well, what, what makes Banana Republic's a great song? You're... Uh, it's a great story. I mean, it's, it paints a real accurate vision of, of expatriates mm-hmm. and for, for people that know them and for people that just don't, it's, it's a very vivid image and still, it's, you know, that's, that's probably one of, you know, and you get into the most requested song, you mm-hmm. know, uh, favorites of mine, of, of my performance, but that are both got to be one of them and I think it's the best reason. Okay. Okay. And it's also, I mean, you talk about humor, the, yeah, and the wordplay of words we can dance to and a melody that rhymes. Yeah, but I mean, that, that, the whole thing, it's a, it's a great song. I got to ask you about Elvis Imitators. <laughs> and you recorded it before Steve did. Yeah. And uh, Steve and Michael Smith put it together, but how did you come to, to, I mean, I know Steve performed it on stage about the same time, but you put it out on this sort of limited edition single yeah and it's freddy and the fish sticks freddy and the fish sticks yeah because people didn't know they were so the the engineers didn't want their names on it they were so ashamed of what we did to it (laughs) and you know but the thing was the jordan air sang on it Uh uh-huh that's the original jordan air that i got to sing on elvis imitate and uh i mean it's it's, the, the appeal of the song is obvious but uh how did it did goodman come to you and say no, I, just, I love he played it for me when I love that song. I mean, I thought of it as a great stage song. Sure. And, you know, and when I first heard it and we went in and just as a joke, we did it in the studio, you know, as mm-hmm. Freddie and the Fish Sticks thing. And then we everybody kind of got such a hoot out of it. And we said, well, let's just call the Jordan Airs. Hell, they came over. Mm. And then, so we put the Jordan Airs on. It, it's know, down in Elvis. I mean, I'm an Elvis fan of all the Elvis. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so this is down in Nashville. Yeah, we did it in Nashville. Was Goodman involved in the recording of that? Do you think? No. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. On that out, al- there, there's an album that came out at the same time, somewhere over China. You're and, and you have a reference to a reeferette named Freddie Fishstick. You know, I mean that's just another one of your mythical just another members mythical of the band. character who appeared later in the book. Too. Right. Right. Um, you put that out as a single, but not on an album. Did it go anywhere? Or how did? Hell no. <laughs> I did it in Las Vegas, you know. I did it in Las Vegas a couple of years. It's kind of a fun song. It pops up every now and then. So, was it a limited pressing of a single? Or how? I mean, was, I can't remember. It's just kind of a joke to get it out there. Uh, yeah, I don't know why I can't remember. Yeah. And the other one that you recorded of his California Promises. That was uh, the last thing I did, yeah. Yeah, and he, uh, I mean. I just love that song, and then Rita Coolidge came and sang on it. I mean, it just kind of made it. Right. That's that's, that's magic. Those things kind of come into play. That was one of those lady comments. Well, I got this song, you know, and he played it for me, and I went, oh, yeah. (laughs) We thank you and appreciate you dropping in for the Paul Leslie Hour today. You know, you can help the Paul Leslie Hour in our mission to provide independent media content like this by visiting www.thepaulleslie.com slash support. We truly thank you. This is your announcer speaking. Performance of the Entertainer intro song and Corina Corina outro song courtesy of John Primerano. Well, that's it for today. So until next time, be safe and be good.